Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Chasing Dreams podcast. Today, I have a special guest, Miss Deja Lewis, and we are talking about breaking generational curses, okay? Deja Lewis is an office management specialist who teaches African-American women how to build sustainable businesses with the use of successful business management skills. Before coaching, she started two other businesses and discovered her passion for teaching women how to break the generational curses of poverty and financial anxiety. She received her bachelor's degree from Christopher Newport University in business administration with a concentration in management in May 2019. (laughs) It was in November 2019 that she began coaching women. And in addition to coaching, Ms. Uh, Ms. Lewis is a motivational speaker for online and physical events. Welcome to the podcast, Deja. Well, thank you for having me, Tiara. I appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm excited for this one. I feel like you're one of those people where um, it was like an instant bond and like this like yeah. synergy and this, you know, connection where it's just like, ah, you're dope. Ah. <laughs> so I am excited for today's conversation. I'd like to start it off by asking, what's the dream for you? Sure. So the way I would define the dream for me is it's more than just this goal. It's more than something that sort of like a new year's resolution that you set. And then, you know, in January, February, it's gone it's off the water you never think about it anymore the dream is something that it keeps like it wakes you up at night it keeps you up at night you're like I gotta write this down this hit me you know this guy speaking to me whatever the case may be it's it wakes you up in the morning it gets you going and it it basically plans your day for you you know (laughs) yeah it schedules your day literally you're like okay I want to do this I gotta make sure I get this done it's just back and forth it's back and forth exactly that's the dream. Um, and I think we come to terms with realizing our dreams when we get that feeling and we just accept it and we stop fighting it. And you're like, yes, this is the dream. This is the goal for my life. For sure. So when did you realize the dream and how has it changed over the years? Sure. So my, my dream is a kind of a, a whirlwind of a story that kind of just looped me back around that God had already called me to be. It's like, you know, but you try to chase away from it and you look and back then the bring all back <laughs> he brings you right on back right so when I was a little girl I've always been really really keen on counting money saving money just really wanting to be around it I remember I saved like 11 dollars and pennies when I was little so that I could always buy me and my sister ice cream it was just something that I I just did and I liked it I enjoyed it And I always thought it was strange. I never really thought anything of it until I got older. And I realized that I really, really am passionate about finances. I'm passionate about money. I'm passionate about learning how to invest and things of that nature. Because it's silly when you're a kid and you think about that story. But you get older and look back at it and it's like, wow, that's always always been been who I am. Exactly. And so um, when I realized, like, okay, I want to make money. I, what, what do I want to do in my life? And this is me in like middle school. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to just be a lawyer because growing up in a small town, that's what we know. We think that the people who have money are doctors and lawyers. And, you know, we don't really think about any other way. Your parents are always telling you, oh, they're just going to be a doctor. She's going to be a lawyer. She's going to make so much money. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to be a lawyer then. Fine. And I threw entrepreneurship just completely out the window and pursued that. I read about it. I joined clubs. Anything I could get my hands on that would train me, prepare me to be a lawyer. That's what I did. And um, I went to, I got to my senior year of high school and I actually joined um, the FBLA, the Future Business Leaders of America, I think it was. And I ended up being a bit, I ended up being the president. I kind of just stumbled upon it. A teacher told me like, I see this in you. You should definitely be the president. And I just, you know, I just was like, okay, well, I'll run it. She asked me to, no big deal. But I, I didn't think that's where I was supposed to be. I knew I was going to law school. <laughs> just knew, oh, just knew. <laughs> but, right. So I got to college and I, um, I majored in government. And I was actually really, really good at my classes. I was making A's, high B's. Um, but I realized that it was just not my calling. I, 
all the writing, all the research, like, and that's fine if you're really, really into it and you're passionate about it. And it, and it just wasn't there for me. Mm-hmm. I did it because I felt like I had to keep my grades up, not because I really wanted to be there. Right. And um, so I just discovered a little bit more, went into prayer and just kind of sitting down and trying to kind of figure out, okay, what should I do here? And I stumbled upon business, excuse me, and it literally transformed me. And I what I grew to understand is, while I made great grades in my government classes, my business classes were a lot harder, but it was challenging me and it took me out of my comfort zone and it built me to be a lot better, a lot stronger. And it helped me to start those two businesses and taught me literally everything I needed to know going into my, my full-time career and in my business that I have now. Awesome. And I just want to highlight a a small detail that we kind of brushed over a little bit, but let's, I I just want to acknowledge the importance of people speaking life into you. Yeah. That teacher that saw something greater, saw something bigger, or even just saw something different, you know, um, her one seeing it and then acknowledging it and communicating to you, like, I see this in you. Right. Um, And one, your purpose was found when you were a kid. You yeah. didn't know that was your purpose. Um, and then even when you were in high school, that teacher is saying like, no, baby, this is your purpose. You know what I mean? So those yeah. outcomes that kind of lead you to your purpose are so huge. Um, so that's amazing. I love that. Love that. Yeah, it's actually, I've grown to realize that it's it's really in those little moments that we find ourselves and we don't really see it until we look back at it. And it was like, it was right there in front of my face the whole time. I chose to, you know, let other people's expectations of what they, and their, I want to say their expectations were not ingenuine or horrible because they were saying it's like, you know, we see greatness in you, but they, what they seen was the same world that I see, this small city where doctors and lawyers have the money, they have the paychecks. So that's what they wanted for me. That's what they seen in me. Right. So they people, make you to be safe and comfortable. And- exactly. Safe and comfortable. And that's just, it, and that has never been me. I've never been safe. I've never been a safe and comfortable person. I've always I've, been a real safe. <laughs> yeah. As someone who is also prone to like, I have a very high tolerance for risk. Um, I can understand where you're coming from. It's like, this is, uh, what's the first thing's gonna happen? Like, mm, exactly, yeah. exactly. And we'll, I think see, we'll see what happens. Exactly. And I think it's even worse now because it's like I'm not married. I don't have kids. I don't have a mortgage. Like, <laughs> what's the case scenario? You know. Same here. Um, but I think now is my opportunity to take those risks so that they can pay off when I do have a family, when I do have, um, I mean, I have obligations, but when I have like real obligations, like adult right. obligations, <laughs> you know, when I'm a real adult mm-hmm. for, sure, for sure. So we're here to talk about generational curses, um, and not just talk about them, but how to break them. But I'd like to start by, um, having you break it down for us, like what are generational curses? Sure. So, um, generational curses is really when you look at it, it you would think the name is self-explanatory, and it is, but it's a lot deeper than what a lot of people think it is. You hear curse, and you think of like witchcraft and people doing voodoo over you. And they don't see it as like, this is actually written in the Bible. This is something that God talks about. And it's, it's real. It's a real thing. And um, so I kind of, this was, I learned a lot about generational curses back in, let me see, what year was that? I think it was late 2018. I joined a small group at my church that was centered around breaking generational curses. And I didn't really have a lot of understanding about it either. We read a book, um, the name escapes me at the moment. We read a book about generational curses and it just blew my mind. So um, what it is, is when a family, let's pretend it like this. Say your great, um, say your grandfather is someone who developed a habit of alcoholism, just throwing something out there. And it literally was to the point where it was detrimental to his life. Now, not saying that 
we all of our sinners have, have fallen short of the glory of God, of course. But it's when sin becomes a habit to the point where it has literally taken over your heart and taken over your mind that it can potentially wreak havoc on your family. So this is why we see a lot of the same characteristics that we see in other people, um, in our families, in, in ourselves. So I, do, I have a friend who lost two aunts and an uncle to, um, to alcoholism that caused damage I think, to their liver and it ended up killing them. And she literally sees alcoholism spreading down through their generations. She has to be very cognizant and watch how much she drinks right. and things of that nature because that 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 poison that was instilled in their family, something that didn't affect her, could easily affect her mm -hmm. if we if she isn't in control of it. And it's sort of like when the doctor asks you, you know, well, do, do you have do you have a history of diabetes in your family? Mm -hmm. You think about it like that. It's sort of the same concept. Do you have a history? of abuse in your family and things of that nature that could easily affect you because that grandfather or that aunt, whoever the case may be, right. they didn't repent and try to help themselves, save themselves from falling short of that. Awesome. So how does, I know we got into it a little bit just now, but how do generational curses end up on us? Sure. Yeah. So I will um, talk about my own story and why it actually became a part of what I do now. So um, in my family, what I've noticed is there is a habit of the lack of stewardship over finances. And so, and that can go either way. Some people, they the lack of stewardship is so bad that, you know, they're just blowing money, blowing money on, you know, whatever the case may be, and not consoling God about it, not, you know, they're maybe they're running schemes on people, things of that nature, not being not being good, um, not being good managers of what God has given you control over. Or it can even go in the complete opposite direction to the point where God is asking you to do certain things with your money, but you're so scared to spend your money because you think it's yours that mm -hmm. you harbor it and harbor it and harbor it. And right. so Yep, both of those things kind of collided and hit me. So when I um, got to college is when I really affect when it really affected me because I was someone who liked money. I liked to learn about investing and learn about finances. When I got to college, I my parents completely cut me off. Like it was like you know you're grown, you're out here on your own. I was terrified. I was terrified. I had never experienced anything like that in my life. And um, so my freshman year of college, I got a job, which I didn't, I didn't mind so much, but I liked having my own. Mm -hmm. I liked making my own money. But what happened was because I was so angry at being cut off and how it hurt me because I was working two or three jobs at a time, then trying to study, on, it put so much stress and hurt and anger on me that I began to allow the harboring of money to consume me so I would literally make enough money to pay my bills I would never have anything extra I would be bitter and angry at my parents all the time I never first of all I never forgave them mm -hmm. I never forgave them until maybe like my junior senior year of college um and I literally led that type of life for about three, for yeah, about three and a half years until I realized, like, okay, this just has to stop. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is you think that you're harboring money because, okay, you're making enough money to, to cover your car payment, you know, have a little bit of gas in your tank, have a little bit of food. Mm -hmm. But, and you think that you doing that is giving you control. You think that you are punishing them. But what you're really doing is punishing yourself because, that. yep, because God is not allowing you to have more than that because you're not because showing your hand, your, closed. Hand. your hand is closed. I would not pay my tithes I, because I was afraid that if I paid my tithes, I would never have enough to pay my bills. I would never have any extra money in my pocket if I paid my tithes. I would never give to anybody else because mm -hmm. I was scared it wasn't going to be nothing for me. So I literally developed horrible habits. I remember my um this summer between my junior senior year, I was interning 
And I had like maybe $10 in my bank account. I said, okay, I'm going to put $5 in my tank. That gives me $5 to eat with. And I was literally had to steal toilet paper from my job just to make it. Yeah. yeah. And because I had, I wanted to have that control. Mm-hmm. I didn't want anybody to help me because I didn't want anybody to say I owed them anything. And, and, and then in a way, when I look back at it, I think I was saying that my, that same thing about God, I didn't want to give to God because I was scared he was going to say, you owe me this. Mm. And I didn't want to give up myself. That's yeah. just being real. And so those, um, and those different money habits that I learned growing up, okay, this is, you know, I, my watching my parents, you know, my parents are very generous people. That's one thing I can say. My parents will, you call them. They will try to help you out in any way they possibly can. But when we, what, what I knew is when we got in a bond, when my parents divorced and it was just me, my mom, and my sisters, when we got in a bond, we, we keep this. This is us. Yeah. We, we, this is all we got. We're here. We're, and we, we close ourselves. So mm-hmm. I felt like I'm in a bond. I have to close myself mm-hmm. because I'm in a bond and I just have to, I have to hold That's myself. That's how you were taught to, to respond. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, and that that's really kind of my story with how that that curse of that type of mindset and that curse of the lack of stewardship over finances really, really affected me um, to the point where I just had to let go. And I had to allow God to speak to me and say, Deja, this is the type of life you're going to live forever unless you let go. So you pick one of the two. And what what I find that's really interesting for my story, particularly when it comes to finances. So, one, my mom, my my sister, my grandmother, like everybody on that side of the family are great with money. Mm -hmm. Well, not everybody, but my mom, my grandmother, and my sister are all great with money. Yeah. And then my father, um, not that he's not good with money, but he has like this habit of like, I only want what I need. Right. Like everything else, like spend it, get rid of it, you know. Yeah. Um, but if you need money, he'll come up with it real quick. And my mom would always like when I was growing up, she's like, if ever I needed money, I just had to tell him a number and it would show up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So um so the irony of that is being raised by someone who's really great with money, mm-hmm. right? My mom is an accountant, for God's sake. Right. And, and I've always had this perspective of like, I just suck with money. Mm-hmm. recently I've been working on my mindset behind that and like yeah. okay no it didn't come naturally to me um but it's something I can do better at. it's something mm-hmm. I can work towards um so I've been seeing a lot of progress since that mindset shift yes. um but it's really ironic because the parent that had the most influence on me financially was not the parent that actively raised me mm-hmm. but I think part of it was I saw my mom as frugal. Yeah. And so I didn't want that restriction. I didn't want to feel like I couldn't or I shouldn't or I, right. you know what I mean? Um, and so like, I remember the running joke of my childhood. I was like, mommy, can we go to KFC? And she's like, nope, we're going to go home and I can make you some MFC. Mommy fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now if I want KFC, damn it, I'm going to KFC. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so I think I kind of grew up and was like, I'm gonna get what I want. I'm gonna eat my money if I have to, you know, all that, 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 um, being the free spirit that I am. Yeah. Um, but now as I'm getting into my late twenties, I'm like, okay, listen, that, that's not cute no more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it, it's not cute anymore. So learning to yeah. hold me back. Um, but it's, it's really funny when I work with my clients, one of the questions I ask them is, what are your emotional triggers mm-hmm. in your financial life? Yeah. And I always chuckle at the clients who are like, oh, I don't have any. And then we dig a little deeper and it's like, I, well, I just don't spend anything. And I'm like, you do realize that that's an emotional trigger. Like when we go a little bit deeper, the reason you're not spending is because you're afraid to be without. That is an yeah. emotional response to a financial habit. Um, so no, you don't go, you know, uh, retail therapy or you don't eat out when you're stressed and you know all of the you're not spending but you're 
supporting. That is financial anxiety. Yes. Yes. That is also a emotional response to your financial (laughs) life. It's just on the other side of the spectrum. Yep. Yes, you should say great. Right. But where is the middle somewhere? Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. Why do you think we have a bad relationship with money or some people have a bad relationship with money within a black community? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I think it's a lot of what you just said actually is a good point to that. I think a lot of us come from backgrounds where it's really rough to bring in money. A lot of us come from um, Providence backgrounds or we and literally some of us just had to go out here and get it. I had never experienced that until I went to college. And I went to college and realized that, like, yo, I got to go to work. And then when I get off of work, I got to go Uber. And then when I get off from Ubering, I might go DoorDash a little bit after I take a nap. Like, you going to go get it and you're going to get it. You got to go get it. And so you get scared if somebody tries to take it. Mm. You're like, no, no, because I work so hard for this. Or, no, I'm not going shopping because what if something comes up? What if What if my tire pops while I'm Ubering or something? Because you're so afraid that something is going detrimental, is going to happen and take all of that from you. I've been there, done that. And I, don't don't get me wrong. I'm definitely still working and growing to this day. I have to remind myself, like, Deja, it's okay. You got a paycheck coming next week. It, it's okay. You're good. Like, go ahead and, you know, take a little shopping spree. Don't blow everything, but it's Stay within okay. the budget and you're good. Right. It's okay to treat yourself every now and then. Um, well, and that's one thing my grandma used to tell me, my grandma and my mom used to debate so much about the money lessons my mom was giving me versus the money lessons my grandma was giving me. My mom would always tell me, you know, don't go out here spending your money on clothes and things like that. You don't know when something's going to come up, put it in your savings account just in case something happens. While my grandma will always tell me, girl, every time you get paid, go buy you an outfit because you don't work to spend your money on bills for the rest of your life. That's not why you're on this earth enjoy your life and I think that's just that older wisdom too of realizing that like you know life is short girl go out there and buy you some clothes like you you are fine and um and I think that's just a part of having faith and part of understanding that you're always taken care of and feeling secure and comfortable and who is taking care of you I think that goes a lot into that and another thing is I think in black communities we get caught up a lot in worldly possessions Mm. Get caught up a lot in lot in that. I don't know if you um seen this post. It was a post. Um, do you follow B Simone on Instagram? I don't think so. She was recently she hit her million dollar mark, and that was her goal. She had been talking about on Instagram is I want to see a million dollars in my bank account. Okay. And yeah, and we're like, you know, we're rooting her on. She's she's right. and posting on Instagram as she goes. And um once she hit it. I think she took the picture in her car or videoed it while she was in her car or something like that. And there were all these comments going around like, girl, you got a million dollars in your bank account, but you still got leather. I mean, you still got cloth seats. I don't even like leather seats. But thank you. They get hot and they get sweaty. So what? But my thing is that we are concerned about this. That we're concerned about a liability oh, of a okay. vehicle. This you spend thirty thousand dollars on a vehicle, you will never see that thirty thousand dollars again, because okay. you're concerned about having leather seats in your car. Yeah, so I think a lot of times we get caught up in what people will say and what we want. We want to look like we have money. We want to look like you know we balling out out here. I got this. I got this Gucci belt. I got these red bottoms, and it's just it. It never made sense to me. I remember my dad used to tell me when I was younger. Um, because we live, we lived in the country. So when I was growing up, a lot of the, the kids that I went to school with, the white kids, they came from like old money, their parents owned businesses that they were continuing to find that they were continuing to grow and things of that nature. Um, and then more so like, of course you had like the working class families, but it was just kind of that mixed dynamic. And my dad would, would always tell me that. White people have money because they look like they don't. Hello. And it's it's just a real thing. Wear the same outfit seven days a week. Yeah, for real. For, for real. A reason. Yeah, and that that's why they're able to pass down the, that that wealth, these businesses, these homes, whatever they're doing to their kids, their grandkids, 
and they have those things that last for generations because they're not worried about things like false seats in the car. I got I had friends growing up who I never even knew they were the amounts of wealthy that they were. Their mama came pick them up from school in a minivan, like their shoes were dirty from, you know, playing soccer in them, whatever. Right. Because it's about what your priorities are. Like, yeah. if I had a million dollars in my bank account, I mean, my car would be functioning. For, like, you know, like, it would be together. But, like, cars are not my vice. Exactly. It, it's just, you know what I mean? Like, so if I'm not into cars, like, okay. You know what I mean? like, right. Yeah. Whatever. It's all about finding that healthy balance. Yes, and I remember, I will never forget, my senior year in college, one of my frat brothers had bought this brand new car, and he was so excited about this car and all of the things, and it was like this big, this big truck, and mm-hmm. I happened to know, because, you know, we like, I would go over to their house and sleep, and, yeah. eat, and, you know, I was like their little sister, and I remember one day, I was like, well, why don't you fill up the tank all the way, like, what? And he was like... <laughs> was too expensive to fill up the whole tank and I'm like you bought a car you can't afford to put gas in but right. it was that moment that I realized like men will buy a car just to impress some fem- some arbitrary female because he was single so right. wasn't even like impressing a particular female not even your girl You know, like, it was this hypothetical female that he was trying to impress with his fancy new car that you can't afford to fill up, baby, (laughs) baby. Like, literally, that was the moment where I was like, as long as the guy has a car, the show goes on. Because clearly men are out here buying cars they can't even afford because they think it makes them look good. Right. But you look stupid at the gas station, so what... (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And don't let some car repairs come around. You're oh. probably going to be looking worse. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> right. So what are some ways that uh, starting a business can help us break through a bad relationship with money? Yes. So uh, relating it back to my story, um, when I started my first two businesses, that was when those were like my introduction to investing okay so let i can get t-shirts i can get marketing um i need this i need that these are my startup costs Mm -hmm. and putting money aside slowly to pay my startup costs and okay now i need money to keep the business going until it gets going and so i feel like starting businesses teaches a lot of discipline not with your business money but it also teaches you discipline with your um, personal finances i'm a firm firm believer that what goes on in your personal life will definitely reflect into your business. If yeah, and it, it's definitely real. Like if there's days, like if I don't schedule my posts and there's days I don't feel like posting, I don't feel like talking, I will be ghost from social media. Like so you will know they just just not in the mood. Or if like you know, if I'm going through that spell where because like I said, I'm still working to get out of get into the comfortability of spending. If I'm going through that spell where I'm like oh my God, I'm, what if this isn't a good investment? What if something happens and I don't see a return on this? Then that and that opportunity passes me by. And so you start to learn, okay, discipline in my personal finances because I need to put money towards my business finances. They go hand in hand. So starting a business really teaches that and it teaches how to work up slowly as well. I think a lot of uh, issue is that a lot of people like to jump in head first thinking that, you know, they got to put $1,000 into this or that so um, that they can have all of this. I remember I was working with a client who was also a good friend of mine. Um, she couponed. And so she seen these other couponers on social media with these huge ass stockpiles of stuff that, you know, they just so people can come in and just shop. Which is also a financial, uh, emotional response to finances, but continue. (laughs) Right. And so she was like, you know, well, really, I really, really just want a really big stockpile. So I just started asking her questions, you know, I was like, okay, well, where would you put these items? Because she, she has an apartment. So she was, I was like, where would you put these items? She doesn't really have a space for the items. Okay. So, you know, we discussed like, okay, we get, if we start building up our inventory, could we use your mom's house? And she was like, yeah, that would work. We could do that. Cool. Not a problem. But we look at how much your budget is 
versus how much it would cost for you to, to get this whole huge stockpile at one time, they don't align. So it's you have to look, it's okay to follow people that are in the same industry as you, but you have to realize that they started from somewhere. Most of them did not wake up and go to the store and get that huge stockpile of items. That and what was the goal for the stockpile to just hold it? Basically wanting to, like, you know, just have that so people can come in and basically use her like the grocery store. And Oh, so she was selling. Um, I'm sorry? Like buying it on the low and then upselling? Right. Yes. Okay, because I was like, what's the point? But okay. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. She wanted that, but the budget that she had to start her inventory just wasn't big enough to, to do that. So I'm, I had to tell her and show her, this is how we start low. And this is how we build up the money to reinvest and do that one day. But right now we got to work with the small pictures, the small bundles, you know, taking that money, saving it and putting towards that goal. And she just, it, it opened that up for her because she didn't realize that, you know, that was a possibility. Mm-hmm. And you can do that. It's okay to start small. And people aren't, a lot of times when we think people are knocking us for starting small or, you know, oh, you only got $100, I mean, excuse me, 100 followers on Instagram. Most people aren't thinking like that. Yeah. Most people really aren't. It's in our heads. It's a limited belief. For sure. And just a couple of things to, to piggyback off what you said. I think when you start small, that's when you can safely make mistakes yes, and, and figure things out and figure out what works, figure out what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, like five people showed up to my first event. But yes. one, I had humility and I was like, if only one person walked away with something good, it's a win. You know exactly. what I mean? So first of all, having that humility, <laughs> but also it was a learning opportunity because I learn as I grow. Yes. You see what I'm saying? So yep. that one event that was a couple of hours turned is, you know, my loving me conference. I'm coming up on the fourth conference. Yeah. It's about to be a three day weekend. Like, and it was a three day weekend last year, but I'm just saying like, you have to get it. Like you had, I started off trying to do a three day weekend. It would have been mayhem. Right. Mayhem. You have to figure out what works for you. And I will say, um, Starting a business did help me with my finances, but going full time, baby, because <laughs> right. I didn't have a check every two weeks to fix my like when I was yep. working full time, it's like okay, well, every paycheck is a, is a restart date. You know yep. what I mean? You hit refresh. Okay, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, baby. Ain't no restart here. Yeah, every penny has to be used properly because uh, you never know what's coming next. So, mm-hmm. and it, of what you think is coming but it's also like it's so contingent on sales and clients and events and you know all of the things so um it has definitely taught me to be a better steward of my finances because kind of by obligation yeah <laughs> like I got a choice but um right. definitely being a full-time entrepreneur has um challenged me to do better with my finances and mm-hmm. challenged me to be more responsible um mm-hmm a whole month to get through every month you know right <laughs> the bills are still gonna come yep so we've talked about generational curses um what they look like where they yep. come from how they end up coming to us what are some things we can do to break generational curses so that we no longer pass those on yes 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 so yeah i actually um this is a very very interesting one because it's so simple but yet I think it's the hardest one. And it's honestly just pray about it. Mm-hmm. And I really think it's the hardest thing. And the, the hardest thing about prayer in general for a lot of people is that you have to humble yourself. You have no choice but to humble yourself in prayer. It is real because, you know, we we want to, you know, pat ourselves on the back for everything. I did this. I did this. I did that. No. <laughs> No, you didn't. And you're opening up that space for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really intimidating about it. Um, Because when I had that moment, when I finally realized, when God sat down and said, you can live like this for the rest of your life. You could. You really could if you don't lose, if you don't let control go today Mm -hmm. and give it to me. Like, I had had to say, do I want my kids to live like this? Hello. Or do I want to let it go? today because he's done playing with me clearly 
<laughs> we're done here. We're done. We're done. And so it's literally you have to pray about it. You have to listen because that's a big thing, too. You have to pray, give it to God, but listen and wait for that feedback. But also change your behavior. And the change of behavior, and as we all know, when we have a relationship, not even just a relationship with God, when we think about like our human and earthly relationships, and somebody does something to hurt you, for example, change behavior is the best thing they can give you. Mm -hmm. So you really, you have to change your behavior and say, you know, today is the day that this is. Now, granted, it's gonna every day is gonna be a step towards better because you right. know we don't change overnight. But we really have to break those habits. And that's really all that God is looking for is that effort to try and say, oh, goodness, okay, I know that I'm scared to tithe. Okay, this is the biggest tithe I've ever made. This is the first time I'm working full time. But I'm going to trust God because mm -hmm. you know what? My God owns all the cattle on the hill anyway. So, boom. Right. It's having that faith and having that faith to change. Um, and then teaching teaching others to change, teaching your children to change, teaching your mom, your aunt, you know, of course not forcing it on them, but you know, when they're when they come to you and want to talk to you about those things and they ask you for that advice, not being afraid to tell them, hey, hey this is what I've learned, you know, through my journey through this, you know, maybe you should give this a shot or maybe you should try that. That's really how you show people better than you tell them you know people want to see it actually changing you well right they don't want to do it if you ain't doing it so you know put it out there and just you know put take yourself out your comfort zone and other people will be willing to as well absolutely <laughs> what would you say if... <laughs> i'm sorry y'all <laughs> what would you say is your number one secret to success oh I would say the number one secret to success is definitely humility. Mm. For sure. For sure. Humility. That is one thing that has come really, really hard for me because I feel like I've worked so hard for everything I've ever, I've ever had in my life. I've always been one to, I don't, I don't dive 100% in anything. I go 110. I give everything my everything to the point where I sometimes have to like take a break for two or three days just to like escape because I give my hardest to everything. Um, and I'm okay with that. I'm good with that. But I have to remember that the strength I have is not mine. Mm. It's not mine at all. The thoughts I have are not mine. Somebody implanted those in me and somebody, you know, gave me the gift to learn about finances and want to change and gave me the strength to want to be to want to be better and gave me the opportunity to teach women to bring them closer to what their goals are in life so just being humble and remembering where it all comes from at the end of the day honestly because you I look back when I'm having those tired days and I'm laying in the bed and I'm just like how did I just go through the last week I did not go through this last week by myself okay. like, how did it happen it's real it's real mm -hmm. um yeah, so I just, you know, just being thankful and being humble for everything that I'm giving, being able to go to college and learn all these things and be a business owner so I can give it to other women. Mm -hmm. it, it's definitely a humbling experience. For sure, for sure. This has been a great conversation. Where can everyone find you? Yes, so you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Glorify Ventures. Um, those are my main two platforms. And so that is where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes. I appreciate your wisdom. Um, y'all make sure y'all follow her so y'all can get this information. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.